Well, okay. So, shall we try for the first question? Yeah, and by the way, we're going for what? Like, a, I can't remember offhand. It's like a 20 minute interview. Uh, let's just run through the questions and what happens, happens. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, so, the first question is How is your web text uh, innovative in the historical? and or material or technological context it was created in? Man, I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, um, well, but just what hadn't been really done yet that you're aware of that you thought you were like, okay, I figured out how to do something. You know? Well, I, okay, so one thing that comes to mind is that um, you know, there are a series of, of what I guess could be called multimodal texts that uh, are at the center of that project, which in a way are kind of like, um, you know, a, a celebration of that kind of post-alphabetic approach to composition that I think was on the rise is still you know, continuing to rise, and I think especially in the context of some of what I was talking about in that piece seemed, you know, um, apropos, but I think um, what was a bit innovative or different in my approach to multimodality is that it was done algorithmically. I basically wrote a software program that took photographs that I'd taken around town and um, use the color from every 10 or 20 pixels going across and then down the pictures to place selections of text on the screen, reconstituting those images, you know, um, dynamically. So I think whereas I think, you know, many of us in the field um, are working in extremely creative and innovative ways in, co in, in new media, creating, among other things, multimodal texts, I don't think many of us are working at the level of, of programming or algorithm to generate those texts. And so that, I think that was a contribution or that was a kind of moment of innovation. And then related to that, offering the software programs themselves so anyone could go out and generate their own versions of those kinds of, of compositions. So you say that it's post-alphabetic, but those logarithms are layering texts on an image. And creating a new image using text. So can you talk about that choice and the way that you use the alphabet to actually structure the overall text? There's real irony in the post-alphabetic and then your arrangement, or structural arrangement is itself alphabetic. It's really Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think um, that may speak in part to a, a kind of uh, a moment within what, you know, that might speak to a moment in this kind of attempt to move away from the logocentrism of alphabetic writing where we're still kind of trapped within it in order to kind of articulate something beyond we're kind of you know still using um, still using it explicitly but no I think for, to answer the question I think um, you know my approach to writing tends to work out of folks like uh, I guess you could say Jacques Derrida but to me I, I really like going with uh, Leroy Gouron and Ingold and a linguist named Harris, all of whom have, you know, described um, an origin of writing that really begins with gesture. And so, for example, Ingold and Harris will talk about how if you look at the word writing etymologically in ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian, the term means drawing, it means etching, it means scratching. Um, and the point is, is that writing really starts as a visual technology um, or as a way of inscribing something visual into some substrate. One of the many ways in which writing can be deployed is to um, approximate uh, moments of inflection in speech, meaning the alphabet. And I think, as a side note, some of us forget just how imprecise the connection is between alphabet and speech. I mean, I think we have this in, we have this notion in our head that the 26 letters of the alphabet represent 26 distinct sounds that constitute the letters that make up words, that make up sentences. And frankly, I think we all know language is not that atomistic. It's just not that discreet. It's really as um, 
as one linguist whom I've really enjoyed reading, um, Stuttered Kennedy has talked about, it's really more of a kind of sonic event that represents a continuum of sound, and we just use the alphabet to mark moments in order to kind of try to make sense of something that's otherwise so ephemeral and difficult to, uh, to, to lock down. So anyway, the point, I think, getting back to what I was saying is, yeah, in a way, it's kind of incidental that it's text on the screen or it's text in those multimodal compositions. I think for me, what you're looking at are just drawings. And I think part of the appeal rhetorically is because we in the humanities are so focused on print-based language, on text, that we tend to see the text first in those compositions, but I think that's just kind of incidental to what's going on more broadly, which is just a, a novel way of doing visualizations. One of the really interesting things about Mingold is um, he takes that notion of, of gesture and he weaves it into uh, a larger notion of lines. Yeah. He comes about lines. He's even having his classes draw now. But, is it really? Yeah. Yeah, so I was interested in how, while you have an alphabetical arrangement, in a sense it's post-alphabetic because the alphabet functions as simply a, a structure that's pointing. In other words, you're just drawing lines across the community, in a sense. Yeah, and I think, you know, what I find really wonderful about Ingold is, yeah, he's focused on lines, but as he says in... I think the end of the first chapter, the second chapter of that book, Lines, A Brief History, is that it's really about the surfaces working in conjunction with line. Like, you can't talk about line without talking about surface, and so there's a real focus on materiality. Uh, the lines, in other words, become an expression of a material, of, of a kind of differential between two or more materialities that are coming together. And so related to that, I think you know, getting back to the kind of multimodality that I was putting together uh, algorithmically in, in those 26 image texts, where exactly or what exactly is the surface that's being described? And it's obviously it's computational, um, it is programmed, and the lines then really are quite different from the kinds of lines you might put down on um, a blank sheet of paper, for example, or on some other kind of inert substrate. You know, they're, they're, the notion of surface is part of what's being created in the context of those, of those compositions, and that might be another kind of interesting thing to think about in terms of how multimodality is being explored in that piece. Yeah. You mentioned logarithms a couple of times, and I'm really struck by how you're using the alphabet itself as a logarithm to guide the form of, and, and the but you're using that to program. Are, are you thinking about that as you're going through it? The, the talk about writing and lines is really interesting, but I'm wondering if you can get back to that logarithmic theme that, that you had brought up. Um, I'm not sure where to go with that. <laughs> uh, so my question uh, is about the, the alphabet as logarithm or you were talking about the slippage and the gap between what we think language is yeah and that one-to-one -one correlation mm -hmm. and how you're talking about the gap between what the the letters say and how they make words and how those words make sentences and how that makes paragraphs which is a which is a nice uh corollary to how binary makes uh, machine languages, make programming languages, make GUIs, and so So I'm thinking about how language stacks in the same way that code stacks. Yeah, I mean, what, you know, what you're saying kind of reminds me of a moment within that, that piece where, as I look closely at some of the compositions that were, that were generated dynamically, um, there were these really wonderful mashups of text that you just really couldn't kind of plan in advance you know like these there were some uh there were some moments within those compositions where text just came together in such a way where it, it created this really interesting blurred effect almost like wind you know pushing across some kind of you know watery surface and other words in other places almost looked like chain mail just by the coincidence of the ways in which certain lines came together 
Um, but, you know, and so another way to kind of think about the question you're asking is, yeah, I think it's just so interesting to kind of recognize just how big a gap there is between the letters of the alphabet and what they try to represent and speech. And so, for example, when I'm, you know, when I'm, when I was teaching my kids how to read, and Harris talks about this in his book, Origins of Writing, you know, we teach a kid A is like apple, A has that sound, but A can also have four or five other sounds depending on the other letters in which it's deployed. And you start to realize quickly that we probably really need more like 40 or 50 alphabetic characters if we want to come close to representing each of the distinct sounds, like we really need four or five A's. Um, and so the point is, is that each alphabetic character is just, you know, good enough to get us to a facsimile of what had once been said and or to what can be said based on what's notated, you know. And so that gap, I think, is an opportunity to exploit what writing is more broadly, which is, you know, if you want to look at it in kind of humanistic terms, an expression of gesture, or if you want to look at it in kind of post-human terms, it's just an expression of force within a differential of materialities. Um, and I think that what's nice about working algorithmically is that you do work explicitly with that gap. And then you can go in so many possible directions. And I don't think, as compositionists, many of us have really um, broken free of the alphabetic mandate as fully as we can, and frankly, I don't either in that piece, and I do think that's partly generational, or at least I'd like to think so, that the ways in which we define writing are still wed, and I think in a lot of ways, just disciplinarily, to the ways in which the humanities is still so focused on text, to the alphabet, but there's no reason it needs to be there. We could really take that gap in so many directions. Do you see um, your web text as having any influence on the field? That's a great question, you know, and this may not seem like the most obvious response, but, you know, academia is so weird to me. I just never get a lot of feedback on much of anything, you know, like, you know, you publish stuff and then you bump into people at conferences and you may get a few pats on the back, but it's just, it's never, there isn't, as, there's never as much responsiveness in the field as I'd like to get. Um, so... Cheryl Ball has told me that she's used that piece in some of her presentations, and it's been well received, and that's been wonderful. And I've heard, I've gotten some great feedback here and there. But, um, but on another note, it's been interesting to see how it doesn't show up as much in the scholarship as I would have liked to think it would. Um, and I think it's largely because it's not easy to cite. Um, it's an you know the problem with doing new media stuff is that it's relatively opaque to the ways in which texts are um, you know saved in databases, cited, etc. I mean, what exactly do you cite in that piece? You can't copy and paste any of the text. You can't make a link. You know what I mean? So, so no, I haven't. You know, so I think that's part of why if I can really kind of jump um, into a different kind of take a different tangent on that question, why I'm increasingly interested in more kind of public projects, because the response is so great. You know, if I'm already doing kind of uh, creative work, so to speak, or doing work that's rhetorically engaged beyond just a kind of limited scholarly audience, then why not just focus explicitly on the public? You know, I've, having had now three pieces in museums and... Um, one of them over at Seas in St. Louis, I think three or four years ago, being able to sit back, for example, and watch that Connect piece I did in St. Louis um, engage people as they were walking from one panel to the other, I mean, it was just so exhilarating. It was so wonderful to just sit back and actually see the responsiveness. And I wish we could all get more of that from the hard work that we do with our scholarship. But I think um, perhaps more so with folks doing new media, it's hard to see those see that work show up in the scholarship because of the opacity that it has uh, compared to more tech-centric stuff. 